share a little bit about our projects and the journey it took us to get here tonight. Um, it's no easy task. It starts in seventh grade. Good luck, seventh grade. Uh, <laughs> spring of seventh grade, uh, the students are challenged to come up with a skill that they're interested in, but also will be a challenge for them to learn. They then are tasked with finding a mentor, which is by no means a small feat. It's actually the hardest part of your project. Once you've secured your mentor, the magic begins. And so they begin. And that's what you're going to see here tonight. All their hard work, all their dedication, is the accumulation tonight is where they're going to present to you. And I hope you are as, as proud of them as I am. Sorry, don't film that. Edit that out. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk anymore. I would like to introduce, oh shoot, Cliff, I even had a fancy slide, no cell phones, all that. See, you can't trust me. Eighth grade, do not do what I do. All right, um, so first up, Sports Photography by Jeff Sletsky. Let's please. I've always loved sports. Some of my earliest memories are playing basketball and t-ball as a young kid. And as we all know, along with every youth sporting event, there comes those three parents that have to get a team photo after every game. Most kids hate that, and for the most part, I did too. But I always remember feeling like, another team photo. Can we get a picture of me like shooting the ball or something? Over the years, that feeling kind of went away as I grew up. But then around last year, I came across this photo. <laughs> and for some reason, I remember this photo. I remember we just won like 10 to 2. I probably had 0 points, 0 assists, and maybe 1 rebound, so I had a pretty good game. But I remember the feeling I just talked to you about. Another team photo. Another single photo. <laughs> then, after I had my laugh at this photo, I kind of got bored. As any bored teenager does, I went over to Instagram. And the first photo on my feed was this. And then I was like, wouldn't it be cool to be a sports photographer? Then I was like, what if I was a sports photographer? Then I could become the antidote for all those kids stuck with their same old team photos. So that's what I did. I chose sports photography for my 8th grade project. And in this speech, I'll talk to you about the history of the camera, the history of sports photography, what I've learned, some of my experiences, and hopefully by the end, make you guys a better sports photographer. Let's start off with the camera. The first known camera dates back to 300, oops, 300, 300, 330 BC. It was called a camera obscura, and it was a dark room with a hole in the wall. And when light from outside would project through that hole, the an image on the inside would project upside down. Then jump to around 1826, when Joseph and the four Neps invented the first photographic camera. Then, in 1888, the camera company Kodak invented the first film camera. Film was revolutionary and became the camera medium for the next 100 years. Then, around 100 years later, Kodak struck again with the invention of the digital camera. The digital camera was pretty cool. <laughs> and now, we all carry around a camera roughly 1,200 times nicer than that camera in our back pockets. Let's talk about sports photography now. The first sports photo was taken in 1841. <laughs> it was a staged photo of a tennis player, so not exactly the action photo you think of today, but it was a start. Then, in the 1908 Olympic Games, the first great sports photograph was taken. This image depicts Dondo Pietri, an Italian marathon runner who's making his final push across the finish line. This photo was so influential because it turned athletes into celebrities, and therefore more and more sports photographers started popping up around the world. 
As sports and sports photography grew, magazines started popping up. Then in 1945, the first Sports Illustrated was published. Sports Illustrated is now one of the most popular magazines out there, and there are hundreds of other mag sports magazines from Bow International to Curling News Daily, and the list goes on. <laughs> and of course, you can't talk about modern sports press and photography without talking about social media. There are probably a million social media accounts out there just dedicated to posting sports photos, clips, and statistics. So most of the sports photos you're going to find are going to be on social media. Once I got my project approved and started looking for a, and, and got a camera, I chose a Nikon D1500. I started looking for a mentor, and it was easy to find one. His name was George Katzenberg. We met up several times, and from there he taught me four main things. Number one is self-explanatory, probably the most important. It's focus. Your image should be in focus, so it's sharp and not blurry. The second thing was face. Your image should contain the athlete's face, especially their eyes. The third was action. Your photo must contain some sort of action, whether that is athletic or emotional. And the last thing is equipment. Your, sh your photo should contain the sports equipment, especially if it uses a ball. And some other key things are mapping out where you're going to shoot beforehand and knowing the sport you're about to shoot. After several meetings with my mentor, I felt it was time to go to my first sporting event. And I chose to go one of my, to one of my mom's horse events. And I really wanted to use everything my mentor had taught me. So on the way down there, I asked my mom to really get into the nitty gritty details of how the sport worked. Then once we got there, I found a spot where multiple jumps were facing me so I could get a clear photo of the athlete's face. Then there's the equipment. And how could you miss the equipment? I mean, it's bigger than the actual rider. But that was my only mistake. I made this horse a piece of equipment. I realized only after I should have made the horse in my photo equally as important to the rider, which would have made for a greater, more emotional sh moment. <laughs> I wasn't about to swear, I swear. I was going to say <laughs> swear. Um, and that's the thing about sports pho photography. I hear people say, why do we still need sports photos? I mean, the whole sports video now. Can't we just pause and zoom in from there? But I disagree with that, with that because video doesn't capture the full magnitude and emotion of the moment. To prove my point, here's a little video. I mean, LeBron James making a great dunk, assisted by Dwayne Wade. But you'll probably forget that by uh, Sunday. Now compare it to a, a, a shot cut through one of those guys on the bottom left lens, and you get a whole, totally whole different vibe. I mean, it just gives off a totally different vibe. That's exactly what a great sports photo should do. It deepens your appreciation for the sport and the athlete. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten a photo of this caliber yet, but I'm working on it. My next sporting event was a water polo game. And water polo was a bit tricky for me due to the water aspect of it. Having an athlete two-thirds of the way submerged in water was kind of hard to maneuver with my camera, so I didn't get many good shots. Then, <laughs> there was a track meet. I learned in this track meet, you really got to focus on the athlete's emotion because a picture of them running isn't very flattering. <laughs> I used this knowledge and carried it over to our track meet where I was the class photographer since I was injured. Here I had full range of motion to go wherever I want and I got some pretty good photos here. The last, the last experience I would like to talk to you about, oh wait, sorry, some other sports I photographed were surfing, which was probably the most enjoyable since I was on the beach, some lacrosse, which was my only night shoot, and some basketball. The last experience I would like to talk to you about is the last horse show I went to. Using the knowledge I had gained over my uh, journey with my camera, I got some great shots here. I had changed my settings for a deeper, more rich shot, gotten better camera angles, and done what I had talked to you previously about. I created the horse and rider equally as important in my, in my shot. Now, after this speech, you're probably like, Oh my god, Jeff, you're so cool. I will be like you. But I don't, have a, I don't want to take great action shots like you. But I don't have a nice camera like you do. 
Well, as I said earlier, you guys all have a pretty nice camera in your back pocket. With a few tips and tricks, you can be a great sideline sports photographer. So here they are. <laughs> Number one would be always shooting with the burst feature on your camera. And all of you should have this. All you got to do to use it is tap down on the shoot button and drag your finger to the left. This should allow you to get pretty, uh, a lot of photos in a short period of time. Um, the next thing is, is enabling grid lines on your phone's camera. This will allow you to get nice, straight, and stable shots. The last thing I would recommend is always shooting in landscape. Landscape will allow you to get a greater field of view, which will allow for more room for error, and then if you want a portrait, you can just edit it down to one. Um, so now, next time you're watching little John from the sidelines, you can get some great sports photos of him. So he's not left with the same old team photos. <laughs> now I would like to thank some people. Of course, thank you to my mentor, George, for really teaching me everything I know about my camera. To uh, my parents, of course, for shuttling me around and paying for everything. Uh, and to Miss Fabian and Miss Nico for really helping me with this speech. And Miss Fabian for being such a great and supportive teacher. Um, now I would like to take any questions you guys have. Which one was you in that picture? <laughs> oh. I know, I'm pretty easy to miss in that, right? on stage is Teddy Christian with Computer Engineering. in our lives, I saw this project as an opportunity to learn how to build and know what's inside a computer. Today I'm going to share the history and my process of building and designing my own personal computer. The process, of course, starts with my mentor, Pete Davey. He was a perfect mentor for my project. Pete has worked his way into creating his own business providing IT service to customers in all different verticals, automotive, education, and more. Pete has been a very thoughtful and inspiring mentor to me. I am very grateful for his support for my project. The history of a computer starts over 200 years ago with someone named Joseph Mary Jacquard, a French merchant. He invented a loom and used punched wooden cards to automatically weave fabric designs. Early computers would use similar punch cards. Big jump to 1981 when IBM designed the first personal computer, the Akron. The Akron starting price was $1,565 and used the MS-DOS operating system from Windows. The history of a computer continues to evolve with new technology developing every day. You never know. Tomorrow could be the day when computer engineers develop telepathy computers. Like if you think it, it will happen. Raise your hand if you think that there are a thousand main parts in a computer. Raise your hand if you think that there are a hundred main parts in a computer. And then raise your hand if you think there are ten or close to. Okay. Keep your hand raised if you guess ten. Close to ten. You can see your there are seven main parts in a computer. The CPU, graphics card, power supply, motherboard, hard drive, case, and operating system. So now let me tell you how I put these seven parts together to build my computer. But first, I need to start from the beginning. And that all starts with me and my mentor going to Micro Center. Here we got all the necessary parts for my project. 
this is me and this is this is me and my mentor picking out the CPU. The CPU is the base of any computer system. It stores the computer's main memory and also regulates and integrates the operations of the computer. This is us picking out the GPU, the graphics card. The graphics card is best well known for the pixels you see on your screen. The better the graphics card, the better the quality. Once we got the parts we needed, we only needed to build the computer. So we set a time and date and started building. This is me and Pete setting up the motherboard. The motherboard is the part that connects all the other parts together so they can communicate. It's, all very, it's also very tricky with all the wires. Pete, my mentor, helped me understand how to build, how to handle and insert components for the CPU, for example. He told me to be careful touching the bottom flaps or it might not fit inside the motherboard. Or the motherboard, for example. He told me to be careful touching it or it might give a static shock permanently damaging this computer. Once we finished putting all the parts in the computer, we plugged the computer to the outlet in a wall and the monitor to an HDMI port on the computer and hoped something would appear. Something did. I mean, it worked. It worked. Before this project, I knew how to operate a graphic user interface like Chrome or Windows, but never knew what was behind the device. Like, I always wondered how metal bits can make a picture appear on a monitor. This project has widened my knowledge about uh, about computers and made me want to learn more about coding in DOS. I had a very fun time during this project and would do it again, but I couldn't do it again, of course, without my mom and my dad for helping me and paying for most stuff, my mentor for helping me, oh my gosh, so much, <laughs> and my, my teacher, Ms. Fabian, for allowing me to do the op opportunity to do this project, and Ms. Nico for helping me with my speech. This is a quote from Steve Jobs. What a computer is to me is the most remarkable tool that we've ever come up with. It's the equivalent of a bicycle for a month, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is known as the most innovative computer designer of our time, and who knows who's next. <laughs> to a problem and solve it? Yeah. Have you used it as a computer? Oh, yes, I have. It, like, it works. I can plug it into a monitor and it works. It works. Yeah. Yes, it's all good. Can you get the internet on this one that you built? I can, but it's not wireless. I need to have an ether cable. Yeah. All right. Um, next up is... There's one more in the corner. Uh, I can see. Oh, yes. Huh? Oh no, Jeff is not. My <laughs> this is also not a sport. <laughs> and next up is the legend Roy Brown doing Blaze <laughs> with a knife before? <laughs> and how many of you have stabbed yourself while playing with a knife? Yeah, I have too. And I'll talk about that, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But for, um, I've been interested in knives since I was very, very little because my grandpa has a fairly large knife collection. His interest in knives most likely sparked my interest in the subject. Knives are very handy and versatile tools used in the kitchen to the battlefield. I've always liked knives, and when it came time to choose my 8th grade project, I thought blazemithing would be a perfect one to understand and get a more hands-on experience with knife making. Today, I'm going to talk about the history of blazemithing, what it is, and the process required to make a knife, as well as some challenges I experienced along the way. The first forge blade was, found, was made out of copper and found in Egypt around 6,000 years ago. Around the 9th century, 
the Vikings began the creation of high quality swords that helped them in their conquest. Um, be because of this, they held their swords in very high regards and often gave them names. During the Viking era, Japan was experiencing time of unrest and began, um, and began forging very high quality samurai swords. These swords took up to 18 months to create and only trained smiths were able to create them. Um, only, only practice smiths and, uh, and people of wealth were able to possess high quality knife, knives and swords such as these. But flash forward today and any child with an internet access can buy a cheap $10 knife off of Amazon. Although this knife will most likely bend and break easily because it is low carbon steel. The difference between high and low carbon steel is that the grain of the metal is much looser and, high and more compact compared to high carbon steel, which grain is much more, er, and much more compact. Um, so I've talked a bit about the history, but what is bladesmithing? Bladesmithing is the process of shaping a piece of metal by heating it in a forge or kiln and then shaping it with a hammer. Once the main forging is done, the blade is heated to around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, then quenched in heated oil. This process is called quenching or heat treating, and hardens the blade by bringing the grain of the steel closer together. The blade then gets, temp oh. the blade then gets tempered, which makes the steel uh, more flexible and slightly softer, while still being able to, to retain an edge. Once heat treated and tempered, the blade gets ground to remove any marks that may have appeared during the forging process. A handle is then added, and a final edge is added to the final knife. There are many different techniques and tools used in the forging process, including a hammer, forge tongs, an anvil, a forge, heat reses and gloves, safety glasses, and a belt grinder. Um, I started my project by finding a mentor. I found Tucker Paris online and set up a meeting with him. Unfortunately, I was only able to have one meeting with him before he got a job in LA and was unable to continue to mentor me. My project stalled a bit after that, but I picked it back up around late January um, and I built, when I built a fort with my grandpa. We built this out of fire brick, which is designed to absorb and dissipate heat, angle iron, and flat bar stock. We then drilled a hole in the side of one of the bricks for the torch, where the torch fits in. I was then able to begin my knife making process. Because I did not have a, a trained mentor, my grand, er, I, for, I practiced on mild steel, which is much softer and easier to work with. I, um, I forged eight practice blades before I began my final project. For my product, I forged a Santoku style chef's knife out of 1095 high carbon steel with a burled maple handle. Um, the Santoku style features a rounded head and flat cutting edge and is optimal for kitchen uses. The reason I chose the Santoku is because I like the shape more than traditional knives. Well, um, I also messed around with some scrap metal and forged a small three-inch dagger. And while testing its edge, I unfortunately stabbed myself in the leg, hitting the muscle. <laughs> um, in hindsight, I'm realizing how foolish this was because I'm, I wasn't able to run around and do the things I loved. So, be careful with knives. <laughs> um, I wouldn't be able to do this um, this... I wouldn't be able to do this project without a ton of people, like my parents and grandparents, for paying for everything and putting up with all my injuries. Um, Miss Fabian for helping with my speech. Miss Fabian and Miss Nico for helping with my speech and even allowing me to do this project in the first place. Tucker Paris, even though he was my mentor for a short time, and a huge thanks to my grandpa Jeff Elston, who became my mentor. It's also a hardwood, so it will not crack e as easily. You want to hold it up?
a lot of YouTube tutorials. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes? <laughs> I've heard some blades were made out of Damascus steel. What makes that special? Um, it's, it mixes high and low carbon, which makes it more flexible, but still way harder. And it, um, I was unfortunately unable to do that because I did not have a welder. All right, uh, yes, Caden okay, in the back. Um, what, what exactly were you doing when you stabbed yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, messing around. <laughs> further into that. <laughs> All right. Next up is Kylie Heller with Dog Rehabilitation. Hi. I chose Dog Rehabilitation for my eighth grade project because for as long as I can remember, I wanted to help the animals around me. But, before I tell you any more, I want to show you this video of where I started. So this is one of the main dogs I worked with. His name is Dude, and he has a sister, but she kind of gave up on me during this. Um, um, so, at the end of this presentation, we will see if I was able to help those dogs. Tonight, I will be telling you three things. First, I will be explaining what dog rehabilitation is. Then, I will share how I found my mentor. And lastly, I will be sharing some stories about the dogs I worked with. I want to start off by explaining what dog rehabilitation is. Dog rehabilitation is using dog psychology to help an unbalanced dog return to balance. Dog psychology is using your energy to influence dog's behavior, ultimately helping the dog become balanced within their environment. One difference between dog training and dog psychology is that dog training primarily benefits the humans. The dog can be perfect in obeying direct command and still be insecure or unhappy because their basic needs are not being met and fulfilled with just training. So now that you have a basic understanding of dog rehabilitation, I'm going to talk to you about finding my mentor. When I first got my project approved, I reached out to Caesar Long, also known as Log Whisper. Unfortunately, he was unable to help me, so he recommended that I reach out to Steve Del Savio. He was also unable to help me. <laughs> but recommended me to his friend, Colleen Stekloff, who did become my mentor. <laughs> Colleen Stekloff is the owner and founder of LA Canines. I reached out to her and she responded, saying she'd love to be my mentor. So I've been doing Zoom calls with her at least once every two weeks, and it has been really helpful. I was actually able to take a trip up to LA and meet her in person. This was an amazing experience. She let me work with some of the dogs that she was boarding. So these are two of the dogs I worked with. We worked on place training. Place training is where you guide the dog onto its bed or place, give it the pinch weight, and then walk away. This is helpful for calming your dog and for giving a direction when new people come to your house. Later, we sat and discussed the dogs I'd been working with and continued to connect on via Zoom after that. Now I'd like to tell you about the dogs I worked with. I started working with my neighbor's dogs. Dude, who's the one in the video I showed you earlier, and Ever, his sister. For these dogs, I had two main goals. My first goal was to get them to walk nicely, and my second goal was to get them to enter the house calmly, which you can probably guess why. So to get them to walk nicely, I switched their harnesses from an easy walk harness to a gentle leader. The gentle leader clips underneath their chin and pulls their head back to refocus their attention on you when they pull. 
This worked pretty well on Dude Ember, but they're still pulling a little bit, so I added a backpack. The backpack made it so that they were engaged mentally as well as using more physical energy. It's important to use the mental energy as well because just like humans, dogs need mental stimulation. The backpack also gives them a sense of purpose that most dogs are lacking in their lives. We then started working on the way we exit the house because the way you exit the house and start the walk has a huge impact on the way your whole walk will go. For instance, if they barge out of the door pulling you, they will can most likely continue that state of mind throughout your entire walk. It's not going to be very fun. But if they're calm and waiting beside you, you're going to have a much better experience. Um, I then, as I said earlier, my second goal was to get them to enter the house calmly. For this, I would open the door a little bit, wait for them to calm down, and then open it a little bit more. This created calmness before they came inside. Now I would like to tell you what I discovered during my project. I learned so much during this experience, but the main thing I learned is that human's energy has a huge impact on the way the do your dog reacts. Another thing I learned is that changing tools can be extremely beneficial for changing unwanted behavior. The tool you use is generally determined by two things. First, the dog's energy level, and second, the way the human feels about the tool has a huge impact on the effectiveness of that tool. Um, I really enjoyed working with Clean, and she was an amazing mentor. I plan on continuing to work with animals in the future, and hopefully as a career choice when I'm older. All right, so how many of you remember the video I showed you in the beginning of this presentation? Well, let's take a look and see if you guys can attack the difference. I added the music because why not? <laughs> so I'm still working with the door a little bit in this, just to make sure that he's completely calm before coming in. And again, his sister slightly bailed on me. the way your dog behaves. So let's wrap this up with some thank yous. I'd first like to thank my mom and dad for always supporting me and listening to me when I tried to teach some dog psychology, even though it didn't really work out. <laughs> Next, I'd like to thank my mentor, Colleen Seckloff, for teaching me so much. I hope to be able to work with her in the future. Um, then I'd like to thank Miss Fabian and Miss Nico for giving me this opportunity and helping me write this speech. And next up is the legend herself, Molly Stahl. I want you to think back to the last time you received a bouquet of flowers. Do you remember how it made you feel? Whether it was a special birthday bouquet or a get well soon gift, I can guarantee it made you feel something. Flowers have such an emotional impact on humans, which is one of the reasons why I chose to learn more about floral design for my project. For example, a pale, bright bouquet can make someone feel whimsical, whereas a more dark and vibrant bouquet can give the viewer an energized feeling. Today, I'll be talking about three main things. The history and early uses of floral design, what I learned throughout this experience, and some simple tips to help you make a bouquet. Let's start by going way back to 2800 BCE, when floral design made its first known appearance, which was said to be in Egypt. During this time, floral designs were depicted on bas reliefs. Flowers were also used in special ceremonies or as decorations. The lotus flower was very popular during this time, which you can see here, and could be found in almost all Egyptian designs. Eventually, the use of floral design spread to many other cultures around the world. But one of the most influential eras was the Victorian era, which started to shape floral design into what it is today. Throughout this era, floral design began to be considered as an art form, rather than just for ceremonial or decorative purposes. 
Magazines and books about floral design were published, and many people began to heavily decorate their interiors with flower arrangements. And it even became a requirement for young girls to learn how to design flowers. Nowadays, floral design has turned into an art form that is used all around the world. Interiors are furnished with floral arrangements to add a fancy finishing touch, and flowers are commonly given as gifts for, for special occasions. But let's talk more about how I learned to become an amateur florist and my experience working with flowers. At the end of seventh grade, when it was time to choose our projects, I knew that I wanted to do something with flowers. I've always loved flowers, whether they're in a bouquet, planted in the yard, or even a perfume, so I thought floral design would be the perfect choice. Finding my mentor was one of the easier parts of my project, as I already knew a family friend, Kelly Philpan, who owns a floral design business, who agreed to be my mentor. Learning floral design was much like learning any other skill. I started out with the basics and slowly worked my way up to more complex arrangements. Although I was eager to instantly start designing at my first mentor meeting, I first had to learn the basics, like how to care for flowers to make sure they live to their maximum potential. But soon enough, I made my first floral designs, which were corsages and boutonnieres made for prom. I continued to meet with my mentor a couple times a month and made different themed arrangements for the upcoming holidays, which can be seen here. Around October, I made my first bouquet with no guidance from my mentor. These lacked a clear focal point and enough foliage, and I have grown so much since when I first made these. Towards the end of the year, I made three types of lays. A traditional Hawaiian lay, a tea leaf lay, and a head lay. Now, the traditional Hawaiian lay and the tea leaf lay I learned from my mentor, but I learned to make the head lay while attending a guided floral design workshop class. All three of these designs required a lot of patience, which is something I struggled with but worked to overcome. Now, I have to admit, floral design is not as easy as just throwing a bunch of flowers into a vase. It requires a lot of patience and careful planning. In the beginning, I found myself remaking bouquets a number of times until I got it the way I liked it. Now you may be like, how do I make a bouquet? I'll be sharing, you, I'll be sharing with you three tips that may assist you the next time you make a bouquet. The first tip is to make sure you are using various forms of flowers. There are four different forms of flowers. Line flowers, mass flowers, filler flowers, and form flowers. Line flowers, also known as skeleton flowers, set the framework of the design and are often tall and long. Mass flowers add bulk or weight to an arrangement and often consist of a single, round-headed flower at the top of a stem. Filler flowers do exactly what the name suggests. They fill the empty spaces of the bouquet, and they're often last to be placed in the bouquet. And form flowers add, have distinctive and interesting shapes and are often used as the focal point of the design. The focal point is the part of the design that truly stands out from the rest and is most interesting to the viewer. Multiple focal points can appear in a design, but too many can make the design appear messy. The next tip to creating a bouquet is to make sure that all of the colors complement each other instead of clashing. This is one of the most important visual elements, as color tends to evoke the most emotion in a design. Using a color wheel is helpful when deciding which colors to use. Often, the colors across from each other will work best together. For example, red and green or blue and orange will complement each other best. Not only can color control the emotion of a design, but it can also control the rhythm and harmony. To create a harmonious balance, use repetition of colors throughout the design. Now the final tip to creating a beautiful bouquet is to make sure that you create harmony and unity. Similar to music, all floral parts must be in tune with each other and combined well. Although color plays a huge role in this, there are other factors that must be considered. Repetition is important because it creates unity and organization. Using multiple of the same flower type or color throughout a bouquet can provide a more clean look. The transition through the design is another thing to consider, as you want there to be a gradual change of elements to allow continuous eye movement. Another thing to think about is the environment in which the bouquet will be placed in. For example, a large ornate bouquet should not be placed in a small guest bathroom. The bouquet should fit the scale and color of the environment it will be placed in. Now, here's a short time lapse of me making a bouquet.
Now, I did actually remake this like four times until I got it the way I liked it. <laughs> but here's the final product, and I'm super happy with it. Now, I encourage you to think of someone in your life who may need to receive a bouquet of flowers. If someone you love is going through something hard, or maybe their birthday is coming up, giving someone a bouquet of flowers can truly uplift them and make their day. I would like to say thank you to my mentor, Kelly Philippan, for guiding me through this entire process. I couldn't have done it without you. I'd like to thank my parents for driving me to mentor meetings and buying me all the materials I needed. I'd like to thank Miss Nico for taking time out of her day to help me with my presentation, and Miss Fabian for allowing me to do this project, and I'd like to thank Kylie and Kira for helping me memorize my speeches. <laughs> after you buy them is really helpful and using floral food is also really helpful and keeping the leaves out of the water um, when they're in the vase. Yes? Would you consider this as a future job? Yeah, well, you would consider small business. Well, yes, I would like to do that in the future. Mom's coming up. <laughs> yes? Do you have a favorite flower, Molly? Um, I like sweet bees because they're my birth flower and they smell really good. Yes? Where do you prefer to buy the flowers? Um, I get a lot of my flowers at just like Trader Joe's or just grocery stores. Yes? Do you grow any of your own flowers, like sweet bees? No, not at the moment. Alright, next up is Zach Sklutsky with beekeeping. <laughs> Do any of you know the importance of bees? Well, here's a little fun fact. They pollinate 75% of crops. But the sad thing is, pesticides are endangering them. Hi, my name is Zach Slotis, and my third project is beekeeping. Today, I'll tell you about four things. Bees, the history of beekeeping, my experience as a beekeeper, and bee products. Let's start off with the history. The earliest found record of honey gathering is depicted in the 15,000 year old painting, Cave of the Spider. This picture shows a woman on a ladder gathering honey while climbing, while climbing on a rock cliff. The earliest known form of organized beekeeping was in the ancient Egyptian times. Ancient Egyptian, I mean, the Egyptians would use, uh, the ancient Egyptians would use bee, beehives out of reeds and twigs. The product we use right now, the product we use right now is the Langshirt hive. The Langshirt hive is the, most, is the most used beehive that we use today, and this product has multiple boxes and individual frames that can be harvested for honey and wax. Another benefit of this hive is that it can be used, is that it can be moved with relative ease. Oh. Let's talk about the boxes in the Langshirt hive. There's the deep, the medium, and the super. The deep is on the bottom. The deep, the deep frames hold honey and eggs. The medium is stacked on top of the deep, and its honey, and in its frames, hold honey and eggs. The, the one on the top is the super, and it's the smallest box. Its frames hold honey. There are three different types of bees in a beehive. There's, there's the queen bee, the male or drone bee, and the female or worker bee. The queen bee is the only bee able to lay eggs. She lives up to six years, but is only fertile for one and a half years. So, what a beekeeper does when a bee queen bee can stop laying eggs is they replace it with another queen bee. Moving on to the female bee. The female bee is the worker bee. It collects the pollen, makes the honey, and protects the hive from intruders. This bee, on average, lives to about 30 days, but, and supplies everything for the hive. Moving on to the last bee, the drone bee, the drone or male bee. This bee lives up to 55 days and is only used for reproduction. What? And only in only for reproduction. This bee will this bee will shortly die after mating with the queen bee. Now, who here has had honey? Raise your hand if you've had honey. Well, sorry to burst your honey bubble, but it is bee vomit. 
Honey is made by honey is made by bees collecting pollen, who then chew that pollen into simple sugars and then spit it out into a honey cell like this, and then they then cap it cap it over with beeswax, and that is how honey is made. Another product of bees is beeswax. Beeswax is made by beeswax is made by female bees who secrete this wax under their abdomen. Some use it, some people have made candles and soaps out of beeswax. It's pretty amazing. Another product is propolis. Propolis is used to protect beehives from insects and weather. Um, the tools I use for beekeeping, my favorite, the tools that are used for beekeeping are all, all play an essential role in beekeeping. Like the hot tool, my favorite tool. It is used to scrape the propolis off of boxes and frames. The smoker is used to to make the bees go into a panic mode and eat all the honey and make it so they can't communicate with each other. A funny story though. So one time, my mentor used a smoke around an aggressive beehive, but it didn't really work that well. The bees just, the bees got, only got more angrier and they kept on chasing us for five minutes. We had to do laps to get them off us. <laughs> the next tool is the bee suit. The bee suit protects you from getting stung by more aggressive bees or any bees. How I chose my project how I chose my project was simple. My mentor, Jeff Robertson, I mean, how I chose my project was simple. My mom just found out that we were picking our eighth grade projects, and she was just telling me about some eighth grade projects that I could do. And she brought up beekeeping. And beekeeping sounded pretty fun, fun and I really just didn't want to talk about the eight, choosing my eighth grade project anymore. <laughs> but choosing my mentor, choosing my mentor was also simple. My, my mentor, Jeff Robertson, Jeff Robertson is a friend of my dad's, is a friend of my dad's, and, and, I, and I made contact with him and asked if I could be a little, if I, and asked if I could be an apprentice, and since he's such a nice guy, he said yes. <laughs> my, first, my, first, my first experience as a beekeeper was doing a bee rescue. Doing this bee rescue was very helpful. The first thing we did when we got to the bee rescue was lay a tarp down. Well, the first thing we did was get our bee suits on, and then we laid a tarp down to where the hive was going to be, to where we were going to lay the hive. So we had to get the hive down onto the tarp. So what my mentor Jeff did was he would get a ladder and get a saw, and then cut the branch that the beehive was on. And when we got it down, he laid it onto the tarp, and he would begin, and he then grabbed a bee box and a piece of the honeycomb that was from the that was from the hive that fell, was from the hive that, was, that we were rescuing. We hoped that the queen bee would follow it, and we hoped that the queen bee would follow it, we hoped that the queen bee would follow it, and lead all the other bees into it. And luckily, she did. These are some pictures of me eating the honey from the beehive. It's very good. And, uh, yeah. And <laughs> I want to thank everybody who helped me on this journey. And that really includes my mentor, Jeff Robertson, on helping me on my amazing journey. And my parents for paying for everything and driving me everywhere. And Miss Fabian and Miss Nico for helping, me, for helping me on my speech very, very much. Before you start clapping, I want to, I want to tell you something else. Bees are going extinct, and it's because of pesticides. Some things we can do to help them is plan a bee garden or support local beekeepers or even donate to the World Bee Organization. Thank you, thank you all for listening to our speeches. <laughs> now, any questions? Yes, ma'am. When you have the bee suit on, it's really amazing because maybe they'll like crawl up onto your like sleeve and all you hear is the sound of buzzing. It's really amazing. Any other questions? Wait, sorry, I can't see. Even though I have glasses. Uh, her. Sorry. You. Oh, Jane.
Kingston. Sorry, Kingston. Kingston. I can see you, Kingston. My bad. Can the queen? How many times can the queen be stayed? Wait, can you say that again? Sting. Oh, well, the queen bee can sing multiple times, unlike a regular female bee or a male bee. Okay. <laughs> uh, you. Um, what does the beekeeper do after the uh, queen bee is too old for repopulation? Uh, they'll kill it and then they'll replace it with another queen. <laughs> uh, you in the white shirt. Thank you. Oh, we didn't have time. Yeah, sorry. Did you ever get stung? Or were you pretty protective of me? Uh, I've never gotten stung in my life, which is pretty surprising. Uh, you know, seeing as a beekeeping. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah, they did call my mentor, and then my mentor contacted me about it, and then he said, do you want to do a bee rescue? And of course I said yes. Is he like part of a network of bee rescue? No? No. He just knew he did that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alright. Do you have any questions? Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>
When I began my project, I was given an 8-track music recorder. But after some research, I soon discovered that I would need to take a more digital approach to my project. I consulted with my mentor, and he recommended that I use GarageBand, the app that made me want to do this project. So I used GarageBand. And it went well for a couple of months, and I even made two songs on it. But after my knowledge of the subject grew, I realized that I would have to switch to a more professional software to achieve my goal. After a month or so of aimlessly searching, I asked my mentor on his thoughts, and he said that I should install Logic. As I previously mentioned, Logic is a digital audio workstation and is designed by Apple. Logic was perfect for me and helped me finish my product. My project. Now I will show you my project. When I create a song, I usually use my MIDI keyboard, my electric bass, a synthesizer, a microphone, my MIDI drum pads, headphones, logic, and an interface. An interface allows me to record my instrument straight into my computer. Now I will show you my process for creating a song by dissecting one of mine. When I create a song, I usually start by playing a hook. I do this by either by creating a hook. I usually do this by either playing a few notes on my um, keyboard or by sampling a sound. In this case, I sampled a guitar loop. That sounds like this. Then I create a bass line. I create a bass line by either playing my electrical bass and recording it or by playing a synthetic bass on my MIDI keyboard. That will go something like this. Then, I'll make a drum beat. I make a drum beat by either playing a few um, beats on my MIDI drum pads or by pre-programming and drum sounds into my software. That goes a little something like this. Finally, I'll add some pre-recorded instruments in and some sound effects to spice up my song a little bit. And when I put it all together, it'll go something like this. Sieben, eins, vier. So that is how I create a song. So that's how that sounded. For my final project, I made a mixtape consisting of seven songs. It was the culmination of around five months of work, and I'm very happy with how it turned out. If you're interested in listening to it, it is now available to listen to wherever you get your music under the title Mox Nix. <laughs> Okay. To summarize, multi-track music recording is the act of overlapping different sounds to create a song. I had a lot of fun with this project, and next time you're driving in your car and your favorite song comes on the radio, I hope I gave you some insight onto how it was made. I'd like to thank my mom and my dad for purchasing most of my music equipment and critiquing my music. I'd like to thank my mentor, Christian Natard, for being there whenever I needed him and answering my questions. I'd like to thank Jamie Eipen and Brandon Wang in the high school for um, introducing me to the world of music. I would like to thank Mrs. Nico for helping me write my speech. I'd like to thank Ms. Fabian for allowing me to do the speech. And I'd like to thank all of you for listening to all my friends' projects, and I hope you can make it here tomorrow on Saturday to listen to the rest of them. <laughs>
usually sample music. I try to use non-royalty non songs where they're free to use, or samples. Um, any other questions? Yes? See yourself doing this uh, in the future? Um, maybe as a hobby. I don't really envision myself doing it professionally, but it'd be fun. Um, in the back. What's your favorite two songs to play on the bass? Favorite two songs to play on the bass. Or do you have two favorite? Like playing "Sunshine of Your Love" on the bass. I like playing. Ooh, that's a tough one. Play another one bites the dust. <laughs> Yes, computer song. Um, have you listened to an LP recording of old records, and do you notice a difference in the quality of the recording? Um, usually, um, for me at least, I, when I listen to LP songs on a record, they sound a bit scratchier, but um, that's just <laughs> my preference. Um, Kingston. Um, I don't play the real drum. They play something, as I said before, a drum machine. It's like a mini version of the drums. Um, yeah. Where'd you get the name? What's knock next? It basically means don't worry about it or does nothing. It's derived from the German word mux nix, which basically means does nothing or means nothing. <laughs>